if you're just out to take them. Just like any time. Okay. Well, hello everyone. So I'm Molly Fleece. I'm one of the assistant professors in the Division of Infectious Diseases at UAB. It's nice to see you all today, and thank you for having me. I'm also one of the associate healthcare epidemiologists for the health system, and one of my other hats is working with employee health, primarily as it relates to COVID over the last year. And so it's my honor today to talk to you all about prevention and management of infectious diseases in healthcare personnel. I have no financial disclosures. And so today I will be talking to you all about infection prevention strategies within healthcare systems and how this truly is a team effort involving many different groups of people within the health system, as well as describing the role of healthcare personnel in transmission and strategies to prevent transmission of pathogens within the hospital. And then lastly, I will discuss some basics of contagious disease exposures and management that's important for everyone to be familiar with. So we all work in healthcare, so it comes as no surprise to know that healthcare personnel may be exposed to infectious diseases through their day-to-day -day activities. And this is because any transmissible disease may be found within a healthcare setting. Subsequently, healthcare personnel are then at risk of acquiring infections that they come into contact with. And depending on the transmissibility of the infection or the pathogen at play, potentially spreading it to others. And so the prevention of infectious diseases, exposures, and transmission among healthcare personnel is a critical component of safe healthcare delivery in all healthcare settings. And in order to protect our healthcare personnel from occupational exposures and minimizing the risk of transmitting infections, this requires truly a multidisciplinary team of individuals. This is comprised of infection prevention, employee health, and occupational health. And so these departments work closely together to support a culture of safety for everyone in the healthcare setting. And so three large areas that I will focus on today include the screening, both pre-employment and potentially after exposure of healthcare personnel, education and immunizations, and then ensuring that there is a, an infrastructure in place to create a safe workplace in general. And that might be something like transmission-based precautions that I'll talk about in a little bit. But before I speak to those topics, I first wanted to talk about the role of healthcare personnel in transmitting infectious diseases in the hospital. And this talk would truly be remiss without talking about hand hygiene. And this is because healthcare personnel have frequent patient encounters, many of whom may have an infectious disease or be colonized with infectious pathogens or a multi-drug resistant organism. They may be involved in procedures or simply have frequent contact with patients or highly touched surfaces in patient areas like a computer, a bed control, remote, those types of things. All of which, if not practicing hand hygiene, would put the healthcare provider potentially at risk as well as others that they come into contact with. So in general, the most important infection prevention measure is adequate hand hygiene with the goal to be to reduce healthcare associated infections and transmission of pathogens in the hospital. So this is a graphic from uh, an article in Lancet Infectious Diseases from 2006, looking at evidence-based models for hand transmission during patient care and the role of improved practices. And it's showing that patient to patient transmission of pathogens by a healthcare person requires five sequential steps. That includes organisms being present on a patient's skin or immediate surrounding that then are transferred to a healthcare person's hands. It requires that those organisms can live on those hands for at least a few minutes and that there's some lapse in hand hygiene, whether completely omitted, inappropriate use, whether using sanitizer instead of soap and water, or just inadequate hand hygiene. That is followed by those contaminated hands, then going on to contact another patient or something similar in a patient area. So as with any process that entails several steps, there are several areas of opportunities to break this cycle of transmissibility in the healthcare setting with proper hand hygiene. And that is detailed in the WHO guidelines on hand disinfection specifically your five moments of hand hygiene. This should be done by all healthcare workers with every patient encounter. And so hopefully this will serve as a reminder that hand hygiene remains a basic yet imperative aspect of preventing healthcare 
person infections in the workplace. So aside from hand hygiene and transmission from that, another important topic to talk about is this concept of presenteeism or healthcare persons working while sick. And so this is especially important during COVID, certainly with rising cases of the Delta variant within our community. And unfortunately, we know that this concept is fairly common and there are many reasons behind presenteeism in healthcare. Logistical challenges of staffing are felt by everyone everywhere. It's difficult to find sick relief at times. There are certainly financial considerations and uh, missed wages, clinical schedules and difficulty of moving patients in clinics or finding coverage. And then this unfortunate social norm where it is deemed by many in healthcare to be unprofessional to take a sick day, worries of lost productivity. And then lastly, this concept of I'm not that sick mentality. And so this is showing a slide with some data from a large survey of over 500 respondents from 49 different countries, healthcare persons as well as non-healthcare persons. And they asked the simple question, would you work or have you worked while sick? And so their definition of sick in this survey is an influenza-like illness or ILI. And you can see from the survey that over 50% of healthcare workers either said that they had or would consider continuing to work while sick. 30% 30 felt, 30 felt that they could work just with a fever alone, but over 90% of those asked would still work even if they had mild symptoms. So it's always important for us to remember that this places not only our other colleagues at risk, but also our patients, that we can transmit pathogens to others, contaminate shared surfaces, and potentially have impaired judgment based on our severity of illness. And this has led to and continues to lead to outbreaks within healthcare facilities around the country and around the globe, um, with healthcare workers being implicated as either the source or involved in the transmission of infectious diseases. And so here are some outbreak examples where healthcare workers played a significant role. And you can see that these are not from that long ago. Uh, here's a nosocomial outbreak of flu. This is looking at measles in China a nosocomial hepatitis A outbreak among healthcare workers, pertussis, and then certainly COVID. So moving on, aside from hand hygiene and staying home while sick, I wanted to touch on some additional recommendations and strategies to prevent healthcare personnel from transmitting pathogens. And so I will start by talking about pre-employment screening. And so this is done before we even accept our job. Um, where someone in employee health will ask questions about medical history, history of communicable diseases, immunizations, and other underlying medical conditions, all as they relate to the healthcare person's safety and their professional role. Additionally, serologic screening is important because one, it establishes a baseline level of protection and immunity for the healthcare person in question, and two, it records their prior history in the medical records. That way we know how protected that person is in case an exposure does occur. So going across these columns, hepatitis B, um, it is not recommended necessarily for, to routinely screen all healthcare persons, but those who are considered at high risk, so those who would have frequent exposure or potential exposure to infectious fluids, those who were born in a high hepatitis B prevalent area, those with HIV or other immunosuppressing conditions, past history of substance use, or those on hemodialysis. Measles, mumps, and rubella, so MMR, historically and with non-healthcare related pre-employment screening, a history of infection or just simply being born before 1957 might serve as enough documentation or enough supporting evidence to support immunity. In healthcare, however, that's no longer the case that we need to have lab confirmation of antibody titers. Varicella is similar. We do routinely screen um, unless we have definitive evidence of prior infection or prior immunization and immunity. And then pertussis, um, what we have to do with for that is just document immunization history, but there is no recommendation to screen serologically. So not only is serologic screening important, but also is obtaining a thorough vaccination history. And if the vaccination history is incomplete, then this should be completed before the healthcare person starts their job. 
So you can see the serology column is what we just talked about. And under hepatitis B, you can see that the goal would be a detectable antibody level greater than 10. And that should be drawn at least one to six months before or after, excuse me, the vaccine series. For all of these, it's important to have documented vaccinations. If not, then recommending to vaccinate healthcare workers before they start their uh, position. Just a couple of things to note. Pertussis, remember immunity wanes as individuals get older, so even if they were vaccinated, they might be due for a booster. And rubella um, is recommended for all women of childbearing age as well as all healthcare providers. So this is a table from uh, the Immunization Action Coalition recommending and detailing the recommendations for healthcare persons vaccinations. And the big question on everybody's mind that's coming up more and more uh, in the news these days is, okay, so what about the vaccine for COVID as it relates to healthcare persons? And this slide was updated last night. Since yesterday, the VA as a whole is now going to mandate healthcare workers to be vaccinated. So I think this is going to be a hot topic in the media. Um, it's going to be a hot topic of discussion. And I think you'll start to see more and more places uh, mandating vaccines. I wanted to talk a little bit about influenza vaccination. Um, so beginning in the 20, early 21st century, despite efforts to promote healthcare personnel vaccination to flu by various groups, vaccine champions, government agencies, professional societies, healthcare vaccination rates among um, ourselves was low, less than 50% across the board. Since then, the perception of healthcare personnel influenza immunization has evolved from just being a benefit to the employee and their specific health to more of an important measure of the healthcare facilities across the board in terms of quality and safety. And this has moved to an increasing number of facilities mandating a flu vaccine every year. And so this rationale is based on several core concepts. One, the role of healthcare personnel in transmitting pathogens in the hospital, which we just talked about. The lack of clear symptoms of flu in many healthcare personnel who may still be able to transmit the flu. And then the vulnerability of our populations. We take care of very sick and complicated people um, with multiple underlying medical conditions and they potentially could be poorly um, suited to have a flu outbreak in the hospital. So vaccination is the single most efficacious strategy that we have to reduce the risk of flu transmission to our patients. And you'll see across the bottom in all caps, and I should have put it in all red, is that through vaccines, through ourselves getting vaccinated, it has a tremendous impact on reducing patient mortality. And I'll say that again, we get vaccinated for the flu, our patients do better, they don't die of the flu in the hospital. So other than that, we know that we can protect ourselves, we are less sick, we prevent outbreaks by getting flu vaccinated, we are able to come to work, and there's decreased healthcare costs. So by doing this, by having vaccine mandates for the flu in an increasing number of our healthcare facilities across the country, um, the vaccine rates in those facilities by far and away are greater than 90%, and that alone is having a huge impact on our patients. So another infectious disease that comes up when we talk about infection prevention is tuberculosis. And so across health systems, there are three main areas of focus when you think about TB infection prevention strategies and policies. One at the bottom of this pyramid are administrative controls. This is our hospital or our health system TB risk assessment. So we measure um, ways to reduce the risk of exposure to persons with infectious TB. This might include having dedicated TB infection control personnel, um, ensuring our lab can safely transmit and work with these samples, education, testing, and uh, strict policies in place that go along with state and local health departments. In the middle of this pyramid, we have environmental controls, and this is focusing on preventing the spread and reducing the concentration of infectious droplet nuclei in the air. And so this includes having negative pressure rooms and the education and infrastructure in place to have patients on airborne precautions, which we'll talk about later. And lastly, at the top of the pyramid, we have respiratory controls. We're training our healthcare personnel on respiratory protection and educating them. And that includes proper PPE to wear, as well as our fit testing for N95 masks. And so on an individual basement basis, Pre-employment screening includes screening for prior TB infection, 
and symptoms that may be consistent with active TB. But other than patient history, there are two ways that this screening is done. One is with a blood test called an interferon gamma assay or an IGRA, and the other is with a skin test, your tuberculin skin testing or TST. So the way that the IGRA works is by measuring white blood cell release of interferon when you mix that with tuberculosis antigens in the lab. This is a great blood test. It is easy to obtain. It is challenging sometimes in its interpretation because there is a positive, negative, and also the dreaded intermediate category, which does cause some uh, difficulty with interpretation. The second way is that tuberculin skin testing that I think we're all familiar with from our past. Um, and for pre-employment testing or placement, we use a two-step testing algorithm you can see at the bottom of the slide. Any test that's greater than 10 millimeters in a healthcare person is considered positive. The challenge with this test is this concept of the booster phenomenon. So say you have someone who has had a history of TB exposure in the past, that would be considered latent TB. They may have a negative initial test, but simply that test can boost the immune system to where on their next series of tests, it'll come back positive. So it might be interpreted by someone as a recent infection if you don't consider that boosted effect. The CDC does have a very robust TB website that does help to provide interpretation for these tests, both the skin testing and the IGRA. In terms of baseline testing, how to interpret and to approach serial testing if there has not been a known exposure, and then what to do in terms of serial testing if there has been a known close contact exposure. The CDC also, through the MMWR, has updated their recommendations most recently in 2019 in terms of screening. And so the green box are showing the most important updates to this recommendation. So in terms of baseline or pre-placement employment screening and testing, the new recommendation comments on needing an individual TB risk assessment to have been performed. And I'll show you that on the next slide. The CDC no longer is recommending serial screening and testing of healthcare persons after their pre-placement, as long as they haven't had um, a new exposure and then in certain other circumstances. And then they do recommend treatment of all healthcare personnel for latent TB if they have not already been treated, unless medically contraindicated. This is again from the MMWR in 2019. And this is that individual risk assessment that I mentioned. And so what it says is that healthcare personnel should be considered at an increased risk of TB if they answer yes to any of the following questions. So someone who had a temporary or permanent residence in a country with a high TB rate. So it's important to get history when you're doing your pre-placement screening. <clears throat> Anyone with current or planned immunosuppression or someone who has had a close contact with infectious TB since their most recent test. And this individual risk assessment is important when you interpret testing results. And this is the testing algorithm the CDC recommends. So say you have an employee who has a positive test, but they are asymptomatic, felt unlikely to have active tuberculosis infection, and considered low risk based on this individual risk assessment. They would then recommend you get a second test, and only if that second test is positive would they be considered, and I put it in quotes, infected with tuberculosis or considered to have latent TB. And at that point, discussion and consideration for treatment would be recommended. So all of this is pretty algorithmic. It can all be found on the CDC's website, um, as well as in your employee health uh, records and documentation. So I'm gonna move on from talking about pre-placement screening and talk about more specific exposures and their management as well as how we prevent these exposures. So much of these next few slides will come from the CDC MMWR weekly report talking about occupational exposures of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. And this is guidance for healthcare personnel involved in patient contact or anyone who may have contact with blood or other potentially infectious bodily fluids, people who work in the lab, so even if they don't have direct patient care, or healthcare persons who work within a public safety setting. <clears throat> 
But before delving into management of these specific exposures, I want everyone to keep in mind that prevention of exposures is truly paramount to preventing infection. So this is data from the National Surveillance System for Healthcare Workers, and it's a summary report for blood and bodily fluid exposures, data collected from 1995 to 2007. And looking at their uh, healthcare exposures and injuries. And you can see almost 60% of these exposures through percutaneous injuries were deemed potentially preventable. And you can see across the bottom whether that had to do with safer work practices, um, improper activation of safety features, improper disposal, and those types of things. So the key is to avoid exposure. You will then prevent transmission. And two really good rules of thumb are that needles should never, ever be recapped, and that proper disposal of uh, these sharps and puncture-resistant containers is key. So what steps do you take if you do have an occupational exposure? So the MMWR through the CDC also has guidance on this and how to think through that exposure and the subsequent risk based on the exposure source. So you need to think about the exposure itself as well as the source of that exposure. So looking at box two, uh, you can see that this breaks it down by type of exposure, type of fluid, infectious status of the source, and susceptibility of the exposed healthcare person. So, in the event that an exposure occurs, you need to one, record the circumstances and post-exposure management in the medical record in the form of an exposure report, and all of our employee health and occupational health groups do this, as well as follow state and federal uh, recommendations for reporting. But going through the evaluation process, it's important to evaluate the exposure for potential to transmit bloodborne pathogens, so hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV, based on the type of substance, the route, and the severity. So this would include percutaneous injury with a sharp, uh, mucous membrane exposure, non-intact skin, and any of those with blood, tissue, or other bodily fluids that are potentially infectious, or thinking more about the lab, any direct contact without barrier protection to a concentrated virus in a research lab or production facility would be considered an exposure. So then the questions become the what, where, and the how. So we talked about the what, now the how. So it's important to know what, how that exposure was uh, done, thinking about um, the type of needle if a needle is involved. So with hepatitis C and HIV, exposure to blood-filled hollow needles or anything that's visibly bloody has a higher risk, is a higher risk exposure than exposure to a needle used for an injection per se. When thinking about the what, so the type of fluid, blood or fluids containing blood being of higher risk, and then you have lesser risk fluids, so semen or vaginal secretions, these are considered potentially infectious because they're implicated in transmission of uh, infections um, in sexual transmission, but not so much in the occupational transmission route. CSF, synovial fluid, pleural, peritoneal, pericardial, amniotic fluid, the risk of transmission in these fluids is really unknown. And then the rest that you might think about, feces, nasal secretions, saliva, sputum, sweat, tears, urine, and vomit, are not considered potentially infectious unless they contain blood. And that's because the risk of transmitting hepatitis B, C, and HIV from these materials is incredibly low. So now moving on to the who. So you need to know the source as well as the exposed person. And you should know a background on that exposed healthcare person because of your wonderful pre-employment screening that you've already done in terms of serologic testing and immunizations. But you may not know information about the source. And so it's important to obtain that information from the source patient. And if you're unable to get that information, then it really comes down to um, expert help trying to delineate the epidemiologic risk of transmission based on the who, the what, the where, and the how. We do not recommend testing of the needle or the sharp in question just because that's not reliable and may put you at risk for another injury. So a little bit about hepatitis B. Um, this is a graph from the MMWR looking at the incidence of hepatitis B across the country 
um, from 1980 to 2015. And so prior to vaccinations, you can see that hepatitis B was a significant or could potentially be a significant occupational risk for healthcare personnel, especially if they worked closely or had potential to have exposure to blood in the workplace. There was a large study in the 1970s just looking at serologic prevalence of hepatitis B among healthcare personnel and non-healthcare personnel. And what they found was that healthcare people had a 10 times higher prevalence of hepatitis B infection than non-healthcare personnel. And many of those people with hepatitis B were unaware and they could not recall a specific exposure. You can see after vaccinations were implemented, that the rates or the incidence of hepatitis B across the board have plummeted quite nicely. And you can imagine that this reduces healthcare person's risk of hepatitis B from an occupational exposure perspective. So hepatitis B is primarily transmitted occupationally via blood. Um, it is still possible through non-intact mucous membranes or skin, um, as well as sexual transmission and perinatal transmission. Any person with acute or chronic hepatitis B has the potential to transmit if the right exposure occurs. And on the graph or in figure two, you can see where it says hepatitis B DNA, that would be the hepatitis B viral load, or the hepatitis E antigen, where those, that peak is the highest. That is the most infectious time someone would have hepatitis B and the time of greatest transmission risk if an injury were to occur. So in case of an occupational exposure, the MMWR breaks down post-exposure prophylaxis for healthcare persons. And this is truly determined on the healthcare person's status, whether they are immune, a non-responder to vaccines, whether we know or we don't know their vaccination status or if they're unimmunized or incompletely immunized. So just going across this table, if you have an immune healthcare person, no action is needed after that. They are considered protected. <coughs> if you have someone who went through two series of vaccinations and they are still a non-responder, if the patient <coughs> is truly infected with hepatitis B, then they would receive hepatitis B immunoglobulin times two as post-exposure prophylaxis. If we do not know the healthcare person's immunization status um, and they are not immune, then they not only get the immunoglobulin, but we vaccinate them. And then if they are unimmunized and they get exposed, we give them immunoglobulin and vaccinate them as well. So this table is published and easily searchable in the MMWR um, for quick review and is pretty handy to have on hand. So hepatitis C is transmitted similarly to hepatitis B, but it is not transmitted nearly as efficiently through occupational blood exposures. So the risk associated with one parental exposure is about 2%, and I'll show you in a couple of slides how that relates to hepatitis B, but it's much less. There have only been two reported instances of mucous membrane transmission. So less of a concern with occupational exposures, but not zero. And if you notice, the title of this slide is different than that for hepatitis B, which was entitled HBV post-exposure prophylaxis. This is post-exposure management. And that's because we do not currently have any effective post-exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis C. So the immunoglobulin that I described on the last slide, this is produced in the United States and in general contains antibodies against hepatitis A and hepatitis B. But our current donor pool is screened for hepatitis C antibodies and they are eliminated from the donor pool. So therefore, immunoglobulin would not be helpful in this case. So instead of exposure prophylaxis, this is management. This also comes from an MMWR article looking particularly at hepatitis C. So if there is an exposure and if we are worried about HCV, then all or the exposed healthcare person should be tested at the time of exposure for hepatitis C antibodies, as well as viral RNA and baseline liver labs. If they were found not to have had an infection before, then they are monitored serially every several weeks. And whether they do not develop any evidence of infection, then you are done with your screening. But if they do, then they are referred for further monitoring and potential treatment of hepatitis C if it were to develop. The last of the bloodborne pathogens is HIV. 
And so overall, the risk of acquiring HIV infection from an occupational exposure is substantially smaller than that of the other bloodborne infections I've described. This is looking at occupationally acquired HIV infections among healthcare workers from 1985 to 2013. And you can see the numbers are relatively small. So number of documented transmission events you have confirmed in the first column. These are exposures that were temporarily associated with HIV seroconversion in our healthcare persons, having had a negative test at the time of exposure and developing a positive test later. And then you have possi possible cases. So HIV infection in healthcare persons with no other risk factors and no uh, prior known infection. So overall, very small. And that's because the risk from a percutaneous needle stick is less than 1%. And there are no percentages uh, attributable to mucous membrane or non-intact skin exposure because those risks are felt to be uh, exceedingly small. But for HIV post-exposure prophylaxis, we have made many uh, significant advances over the last several years, and this has been a changing, um, a changing realm just in general for HIV management. But in terms of post-exposure prophylaxis, you no longer need to assess the level of exposure in order to determine the type or the uh, drugs used for post-exposure prophylaxis. There's no more of a question of two versus three drugs to use. Everyone should get three drugs. And all of our drugs over time have become much less toxic and much more easily tolerated. So current recommendations include raltegravir plus Truvada, which is a two drug pill, continuing for four weeks. And so anytime there's a question, certainly your own health system and hospital um, epidemiologists can be helpful, but there is, um, or there are various expert consultation services, and this is just one, the National Clinician Consult Center uh, PEP line, which is uh, quite a uh, neat name. So in general, the risk of transmission after exposure follows this rule of threes. So for hepatitis B, one in three, if you have a significant enough exposure, could potentially have been transmitted hepatitis B. For hep C, one in 30 or 3%. And then for HIV, one in 300 or 0.3%. So the rule of threes to keep in mind. Now thinking about some other strategies to prevent healthcare person exposure and transmission of pathogens. So I'll talk a little bit about transmission-based precautions. So on the left-hand side, you can see our standard precautions, either using hand hygiene with soap and water or with an um, sanitizer, antiseptic uh, sanitizer. And on the right, you have a variety of additional PPE based on the method of transmission of the organism in question. And so this has been talked about a lot, I know, with COVID. But just as a review, standard precautions are what to do based on the assumption that any patient may be colonized or infected with organisms that are potentially transmissible. And so these should be followed for all patient encounters uh, in addition to whatever other transmission-based precautions are indicated. And so this includes constant, consistent, and good use of hand hygiene as well as PPE anytime you come into contact with blood, bodily fluids, mucous membranes, or non-intact skin. And now I'll go through the others. So contact precautions I know everyone's very familiar with. Um, this includes hand hygiene plus a gown and gloves. Ideally, the patient would be in a private room and limit patient movement through the hospital to try and contain whatever uh, infectious disease or contagious disease or organism that they might have actively or be colonized with. It's important to remember to clean frequently touched surfaces very well and often, and then ideally having dedicated equipment within the patient room, if at all possible. When you might reach for contact precautions empirically would be any case of an acute diarrhea illness that you are not sure um, the etiology of, viral respiratory illnesses, particularly in children, or anyone who has a draining wound that's significant enough that you are unable to tr completely cover it, then I would recommend having empiric contact precautions in place. Pathogens that you might also see who, uh, that necessitate contact precautions include C. diff or norovirus, so thinking back to diarrhea, 
Hepatitis A, especially if they are having a GI illness with diarrhea and they are incontinent of stool, then they would need contact precautions. Uh, potentially for cohorting multidrug resistant organism, uh, either infection or colonization. Bronchiolitis, thinking about that respiratory viral illness in children. And moving on to a little bit of ectoparasites, so lice, in the first 24 hours of treatment of the patient. The second transmission-based precaution to talk about are droplet precautions. So these patients also should be in a private room and limit uh, patient movement through the hospital. And these um, patients, we as healthcare persons, would be wearing a surgical mask. And so empirically, we would recommend droplet precautions for anybody who is coming in as a meningitis rule out, or certainly someone with meningitis, or those who present with viral respiratory infections, thinking about um, winters of the past and flu. So adenovirus, diphtheria, um, H flu, and influenza, all thinking about um, infectious diseases that are transmitted via droplets. And then you have group A strep, which might come as a surprise to be on this list, but in the uh, beginning several days, maybe first 24, 48 hours, um, when antibiotics are started, thinking about necrotizing fasciitis, for example, Neisseria meningitidis, thinking about meningitis, and then pertussis, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. And then airborne precautions. So again, private room, but these rooms are different from others in that these patients are kept in negative pressure rooms. Still trying to limit patient movement through the hospital, but we as healthcare persons are going to be wearing our N95 respirators to go into these patient rooms. The times that I would recommend putting someone on airborne precautions empirically would be anyone who has a vesicular rash of unknown etiology who's coming into the hospital. They should be put on airborne precautions up front. Anything concerning for measles at all, ever, please put them on airborne precautions. And then someone who may have symptoms consistent with TB. Other infections other than TB um, that needs airborne precautions would be disseminated zoster, measles of course, uh, smallpox, if we ever see that again, hopefully not. MERS and SARS um, would need to be on airborne precautions, and then monkeypox. So unfortunately, we still live in a global world, and so this was from last week, I believe, of a patient who traveled from Nigeria to Dallas through the Atlanta airport, who then was hospitalized in Dallas soon thereafter with monkeypox. And so the CDC has done an outstanding job tracking down anyone and everyone who may have come into contact with this patient and monitoring for the development of symptoms. What is encouraging, or the bright side about this whole story is that we are all still masking, certainly on the plane and in the airports. And so right now, it does not seem that there have been any secondary cases, mostly because of the masking. And so if you ever run into the situation where you're not sure what, what type of precautions uh, a patient's illness may necessitate, certainly turn towards your hospital epidemiologist and infection prevention group. But then also the CDC on this website um, has fantastic tables. You can search for uh, any and every illness you can think of and they will tell you what type of precautions are recommended or there's an entire empiric uh, precautions table as well based on symptoms. So I would recommend looking at this if you ever have questions. So lastly, I wanted to talk about some basic tenets of exposures, how they're managed, and then a couple of different specific disease um, exposure workups. So in general, there are some basic tenets of exposures. Um, one is that there's just no good time for an exposure ever. Even if it's not a Friday, there's an entire paper written about how it seems like most of these exposures occur on a Friday afternoon when everyone's trying to leave town or leave the hospital. It, they tend to involve more than one department and at least affect more than one area, and those areas tend to be large open rooms where many people congregate, which makes it quite difficult to work through. And almost every exposure involves some type of vulnerable patient population, um, and this certainly causes great anxiety among patients and staff. It is important to remember that many exposures do not actually cause secondary cases, or if they do, um, most of the secondary cases are mild. But depending on what the infectious disease or the contagious disease is, there is potential for short and long-term complications, whether it's just absence from work, 
uh, certain treatments that may have side effects or be considered toxic, the development of a chronic illness, potentially death as well. So exposure workups take a significant amount of time, money, resources, and manpower. So the goal, again, for all of this is to prevent any exposure from happening. But if we do have an occupational exposure, it comes back to the basic questions, the who, the what, the where, the when, and the how. So who? So the goal is to identify all patients, visitors, staff, anybody who may have been exposed to the source patient and determine if they are susceptible or immune. So you can imagine for healthcare persons, we should know the immunity of everyone, but for the visitors and uh, potential people who are coming in and out who may not actually be employed, uh, we won't know off the bat their immune status and that makes it quite difficult. Anyone who is not immune, or if we do not know their immune status, uh, the goal would be to prescribe post-exposure treatment, if there is any, and then instituting work restrictions, thinking about for healthcare persons. So the what, we need to know what the infectious organism is, or what the communicable disease is, and what PPE may or may not have been used in those cases. The when, when was the exposure in terms of uh, trying to track down who may have been around that patient um, and timing from the exposure to post-exposure prophylaxis and the where. So where did the exposure take place? Where were the healthcare persons and or other patients or staff in relation to the source patient? Were they sharing the same room? Were they six feet away? Were they outside the door? Were they in an area where the air is recirculated? So they may not have been physically next to the patient, but they might have been within the same breathing space. And then the how, how did it happen so that way we can change our policies, educate, and work towards preventing an exposure in the future. So a couple of diseases just to talk about. So varicella zoster virus exposure. So the top picture I am showing you a gentleman with fever and a vesicular rash or chicken pox. Um, if you could see the picture a little bit more closely, you could see that these vesicles are in various stages of healing, so different than smallpox, where they would all be in the same stage of healing in an emergency. And then across the bottom, you see vesicular lesions in a nice dermatomal distribution. That would be consistent with shingles. If it were not in a dermatome or if it crossed more than three dermatomes, it would be considered disseminated zoster. Patients, like I said, with a vesicular rash up front should be an airborne and contact precautions. And the duration of those precautions should stay on until all of the lesions are crusted over and dry. So an exposure to VZV in the healthcare setting would be considered someone who has close contact, so either a household contact, or greater than five minutes or so face to face or direct contact without any PPE. If there is an exposure of zoster or VZV, excuse me, for the healthcare personnel who are immune, all you do is monitor for symptoms. If you have someone who is not immune, then they would need to be furloughed from work from day eight to 21, and that just has to do with when symptoms may develop. They need post-exposure uh, prophylaxis, and the way they do that is to get vaccinated with the varicella vaccine. And then considering the varicella zoster immune globulin, if someone is high risk and they cannot get vaccinated. So because this vaccine is a live vaccine, anyone who is immunocompromised, pregnant or potentially in newborns, may need to get the VZIG as soon as possible. Getting that does not change the furlough from work, um, but it does help protect our healthcare persons. Okay. So Neisseria meningitis exposure. You would think about this in a patient who comes in with sepsis, meningitis, so headache, altered mental status, neck stiffness, photophobia, or someone potentially with pneumonia, and then gram-negative diplococci on gram stain or growing in the lab. These patients, anyone who comes in for meningitis evaluation or meningitis rule out or workup should be put empirically on respiratory droplet transmission based precautions, so a surgical mask. And these precautions should remain in place until at least 24 hours after the initiation of effective therapy for meninge. In exposure in the workplace that would be considered ex uh, extensive would be unprotected close contact with respiratory secretions. And this is very specific. So anyone 
who performed mouth-to-mouth if resuscitation was performed or intubated without appropriate PPE on, um, they would need consideration for post-exposure prophylaxis. And we use ciprofloxacin or FAMPIN or ceftriaxone for this. The goal would be to administer this post-exposure prophylaxis quickly, at least within the first 24 hours, but as soon as you can. The use of the uh, meninge vaccine as post-exposure prophylaxis is really only recommended if there's an outbreak situation going on, so not in every exposure. So Bordetella pertussis, or the bacteria that causes whooping cough, Think about this in someone who's presenting with a paroxysmal cough, an inspiratory whoop, or respiratory symptoms if they already have a positive test. These individuals should be placed in droplet transmission-based precautions, so we should be wearing our surgical mask, and we should be doing that until at least five days after the initiation of effective therapy. So an exposure would be considered someone who's within three feet of an infected person. So you can imagine that this would include a lot of people, potentially, if someone came through the emergency room um, or had uh, a lot of visitors in and out early on. So the post-exposure prophylaxis that's recommended for pertussis is twofold. Either all healthcare personnel who had unprotected exposure to the source patient, everyone gets azithromycin, or you monitor daily for symptoms for 21 days after the exposure, and then you would get treated if any signs and symptoms of infection develop. And then the last one that I will talk about is measles, so the rubiola virus. So you can see uh, the classic measles rash in this picture. This rash plus anyone coming in with prodromal symptoms of conjunctivitis, coryza, and cough, Uh, and a fever should be placed on airborne transmission-based precautions and probably have a phone call to your epidemiologist and infection prevention team as well. These precautions should remain in place for at least four days after the onset of the rash or if it's an immunocompromised host for the entire duration of the illness. Exposure to measles is very different from the others that I mentioned. So any time in the room with the infected person without a respirator on, or any time that you were sharing recirculated air, um, then that would be considered an exposure. Doesn't matter how far away you were, it's an exposure. Ideally, we would all be immune um, with our vaccinations pre-employment, but if they are not, then the healthcare person would need to be furloughed from work from day five to 21 post-exposure. Get the MMR vaccine, ideally within 72 hours of exposure. And then if high risk, consider the immune globulin as well. And that would be patient, uh, healthcare personnel who are pregnant or immunocompromised. And the last slide I'll mention um, comes uh, from the CDC. This is published in the current opi- opinions in infectious disease from 2015. Our recommendations for what to do with exposures involving pregnant healthcare persons. So this table is a great resource going over various different pathogens, vaccinations during pregnancy and whether safe or not, the type of infection prevention guidance that is recommended, and then whether or not those pregnant healthcare persons should be assigned to those patients or reassigned if not immune, as well as recommendations for post-exposure prophylaxis uh, if an exposure was held. And so that was sort of a whirlwind take through of uh, infection prevention for the healthcare person. I hope that was helpful and I'm happy to answer any questions anyone has.